some of you may have seen or heard about that classic film called The Graduate, <laughs> starring Dustin Hoffman, and as a young graduate, was advised by the crusty businessman, the future, my boy, is plastics. <laughs> Think 1960s, when plastics in our society were just beginning to become a part of our lives in a serious way. Now, synthetic materials go way back, and Bakelite is one of the early forms of synthetic materials that entered our life go back to early in the 20th century. But from Dustin Hoffman and The Graduate to the present time, just imagine how much plastic has become central to our lives. So when you think about it, we should not be so surprised that this has happened because like every other creature on the planet, we use the natural world to foster our prosperity. <clears throat> Birds break off twigs to make their nests. You think about those big muddy nests that flamingos make. Uh, all creatures modify the world around them, use materials, but no creature has been more successful at transforming the nature of Earth to foster what we imagine to be our prosperity than humankind. But imagine this, that wherever you want to begin our origins, and you might start maybe 10,000 years ago when civilization really first began to get up and running in a significant way. Somehow, we did not have to rely on plastics to carry things around. Somehow, a thousand years ago, we managed to exist without plastics. I'm not sure how we did that, but a hundred years ago, during all preceding history, and yet today, it seems that we are increasingly reliant on these miracle materials that do not exist in nature, except, of course, in their basic ingredients. It's when we really began to discover the, the magic, magical properties of petrochemicals, not just for burning oil and gas, but for what we can make out of those basic materials, plastics. So a lot of people think the biggest problem with the ocean is oil spills. And for sure, that is a, a problem. But we are seeing another kind of oil spill. It's the oil spill translated into those many variations on the theme of things we call plastics. Now, are all plastics bad? Are any plastics bad? Not the materials themselves, in theory. We just saw that little ROV that David Lang brought out. That's mostly made of plastic. But for sure, that's not going to wind up in a landfill <laughs> or we're dumped out in the ocean somewhere. But how is it that we have become accustomed to the concept of use something once, throw it away? I think it's a business model that seemed like a good idea at the time to have something that will always have a market, always have a market. Use it once, throw it away. Use it once, throw it away, whether it's a, a cup made of paper or a cup made of plastic. It's still that mentality that somehow it's convenient. But now we're seeing the major inconvenience of that illusion that, that what we throw away <laughs> does not go away. Here's the thing. In all of human history, never has there been a better time to be alive, to solve this problem, this, this idea that we are the masters of the universe. We now know what we could not know when I first began exploring the ocean before plastics were there, before we had lost so much of what we had taken out of the ocean as well as what we had put into the ocean. Armed with knowledge, for the first time, we can see that there are limits. You know, elephants can't know this. Dolphins and whales, as smart as they are, can't see what 10-year-old kids of today 
what no humans in the past could know either about what Earth looks like from afar. And to be able to gather the knowledge and use the knowledge that we now have at our disposal. This truly is the most important time in history. We have a choice to use the knowledge we have to really find an enduring place for ourselves within the natural systems that keep us alive, to try to solve the problems now that we know that we've got them. I'm so glad to be here with you explorers to solve the problems going on into the future, and you're about to hear some from some real champions. Thank you. Thank you so much. How about another massive round of applause for Sylvia Earle? <laughs> So while we are setting the stage for a new crop of panelists, I want to take a moment to introduce the one who will be introducing the panel. She's the deputy to the chief scientist and the vice president of operating programs for National Geographic Society. So let's all give a very, very warm welcome to Valerie Craig. <laughs> As Sylvia just so clearly described, our planet is in trouble. And we're reaching a crisis point when it comes to plastic pollution. It's a problem that's global, it's visible, and it's harmful. But it's also solvable. About a month ago, National Geographic launched a first of its kind initiative to grab the public's attention, to raise awareness, and to meaningfully engage people to take action to address one of the greatest threats to the planet today. Planet or Plastic is truly a one brand initiative for National Geographic. We will harness the full power of our media platforms and our international reach, and we're gonna launch scientific expeditions to fill gaps in knowledge, to engage communities, and to accelerate innovation. The four absolutely incredible women that are gonna, going to join me on stage today are helping us get there. They're demonstrating the true power of science and storytelling to address this huge problem and to accelerate change and have lasting impact. So please help me welcome them to the stage. Dr. Jenna Jambeck, Imogen Nather, Lily Gall Sedegat, and Dr. Heather Caldway. I am so psyched to be with this kick-ass team of women. It's amazing. I think we're the all-female panel. So we're gonna kick it off with Jenna. Jenna Jambeck may be new to the National Geographic family, but she's been studying solid waste for about 20 years. And her seminal paper published in Science in 2015 brought global awareness to the role that rivers play as conduits for conveying plastic waste from the land to the ocean. So people are always asking her about the role of waste in rivers and waste in the ocean, but amazingly, she's a lot more at home in a landfill, and she even tells me that she fell in love in a landfill. <laughs> so I hope you're gonna tell us a little bit more about that. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your work? Thank you. All right, so when I was 40 years old, I kissed my husband that I did meet, true story, at the landfill, and my two young sons goodbye, and set off on a 28-day expedition sailing across the ocean with 13 other amazing women to promote women in underrepresented disciplines like science, technology, engineering that I'm in, and math, as well as spread awareness and sample plastic in the ocean. In the middle of the Atlantic, the ocean looks like this, blue, pristine, and beautiful. But when you pull the plankton net or the manta trawl um, that was described earlier through it, it tells a very different story. Microplastic, plastic that's about the size of a pencil eraser or smaller, 
is what we found in that net. Plastic does not biodegrade over time. It simply fragments into these smaller and smaller pieces. And for all practical purposes, it exists on our planet forever. So before we went on this sailing trip, um, we went to this beach, this most amazing, gorgeous beach, to do a beach cleanup. And I walked to the ocean's edge, as I often do. I can't go to a beach without saying hi to the ocean. And so I walked in, and the, the waves are, are lapping up on my legs, and I'm looking out. And then I looked down, and I was shocked and saddened. There was microplastic. This microplastic was washing up on the shore with every single wave. It was a really significant moment for me. I was like, our oceans are literally spitting this material back at us, saying, this doesn't belong here. So we've heard about the animals that are impacted by plastic. Recently, we heard about a whale in Thailand. It died and had 80 plastic bags in its belly. We hear about the albatrosses feeding plastic to their chicks. We hear about the turtles eating plastic bags and the turtle with the straw stuck in its nose. We know that seals play with large plastic debris like derelict fishing gear. We know that the smallest animals in our food web are consuming plastic. When I heard about our trash ending up in the ocean, it was actually way back in 2001. And because I'm an environmental engineer who studies waste management, I immediately connected it to our activities on land. I thought, if our trash is ending up in the ocean, we must be doing something wrong here for that to happen. So I wanted to research it for my PhD. I met with a marine scientist and I said, I really want to work on this issue. And he replied, nobody cares about that. I was totally taken aback, not expecting that answer. And I said, why? And he said, well, maybe if you're in Alaska where derelict fishing gear is an issue, or if you're in Hawaii where the plastic washes up on the shore. But I was in Florida, and he said, nobody cares about that. Little did he know he lit a big fire <laughs> under me. Um, I couldn't do the research for my PhD. I had to do something more relevant to my discipline, but I started doing this research on the side. And 10 years later, that paid off when I was invited to be a part of an international working group where we did get to start to answer some of those questions that I really wanted to address. So we now know that globally, we have produced 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic since 1950. That's equal to 80 million blue whales. Because much of this plastic is used for packaging and single-use items, we've already produced 6.3 billion metric tons of plastic waste. We've only recycled on average 9% of that globally. We've incinerated 12%, and that means 79% has ended up in our landfills or in our open environment. In 2015, we also estimated the quantity of plastic entering our oceans globally from 192 countries around the world from mismanaged waste. Our mid-estimate was 8 million metric tons. These numbers are hard to imagine, so let me describe it for you. Imagine us standing hand to hand, covering the entire coastline of the world. We take up about a foot of space. In front of each and every one of us would be five grocery-sized bags filled with plastic. And that's what's going into the ocean every single year. How does this plastic get there? Well, we know that it can be blown or washed directly into the ocean, or it can be blown or washed into a conduit, a river, a waterway like this one, and also reach the ocean. And finally, thinking about or, or researching the influencing factors, why was this happening? Why were we seeing this leakage of plastic? Well, where we saw was these middle-income countries with really rapidly developing economies where the solid waste management infrastructure just could not keep up with the increase in waste generation and increase in plastic use that comes with this economic growth. Also, there's millions of people around the world participating in informal and undocumented waste management um, that try to contribute to helping this issue. And then finally, in high-income countries, um, we see even though we have a robust waste management infrastructure, because we produce over double the amount of waste per person as people in many of these Southeast Asian countries, even a small bit of mismanaged waste through littering and a large coastline means we significantly impact this issue as well. So I'm happy to say I prove that naysayer wrong. I think people do care about this issue. Um, and so what are we going to do about it? Well, you're going to hear some amazing stories and solutions here in a minute. Um, but when I think about this, I think about an integrated approach. 
So all the way upstream, there's choices that you and I can make every day. Um, those of us that have the luxury of these choices, not everybody has access to clean water, but if you do, a reusable water bottle, uh, a cloth bag, saying no to plastic straws, these choices sound boring. But honestly, our research shows that taken collectively and over time, these choices make a difference. We need to think about redesigning our products, looking at material substitution. Can we actually meet people's needs and increase livelihood without producing waste, decoupling that waste generation rate from economic growth? And finally, we need culturally appropriate and context sensitive, safe and sound waste management around the world. So we all have a role to play, our government, our industry, our private companies, um, academia, citizens, you and I. Collectively, we hold the solution to this in the palm of our hand. We can make a difference together. Thank you. We won't let you get too depressed. There's always a silver lining in each of these talks. So a couple of months ago, Imogen Knapper became one of the first Sky Ocean Rescue Scholars, which is a collaboration between National Geographic and Sky Media. So you just heard Jenna talk about how plastics can break down into small bits over time into a form that becomes really difficult to remove from the environment. But what about the trillions of bits of plastic, microscopic bits of plastic that start out that small? What about those? Where do they come from? Well, in about five minutes, I think all of you might be questioning your clothing choices. That'll be just a little clue. So in addition to studying microplastics, Imogen is also a reserves officer in the Royal Navy. Yes, they are truly a kick-ass team of women up here. <laughs> and she's just two weeks away from getting her PhD, so this is a very exciting moment. Imogen. I've always had a really strong connection with the ocean. I'm from a really small seaside town called Clevedon, which is near Bristol in the United Kingdom. It's known for its fish and chips, its really long old Victorian pier, and we look over estuary to our neighbouring country of Wales. But I'm also connected to the ocean in a variety of different ways. As said, I'm an officer in the Royal Navy Reserves, and I specialise in mine warfare. And I'm also a really keen surfer, and I'm really lucky to live near Cornwall, which is the California of the UK. <laughs> but how am I here at the Explorers Festival as a marine scientist? And it's quite interesting to look back and connect the dots. I had no idea what I wanted to do after school, really no clue. I knew I really liked research, and I also really enjoyed science, but I hadn't had that passion I didn't know what I wanted to study. I remember flicking through a prospectus of a university I wanted to go to and looking at all the science topics, and I picked biomedical science. So there I was. But during my undergraduate degree, I got really involved in surfing and beach cleans. And there's one beach that has stayed in my mind. It's a beach that I regularly surfed at as well. To the eye, the surface looks really clean. There are no bottles, there are no bags, but when we started to dig through the sand, we found lots and lots of tiny microplastic pieces, plastic less than five millimeters in size. And this really shocked me, it angered me, but also gave me a lot of curiosity. Where is all of this tiny bits of plastic coming from that are on my beaches? So this fueled my passion, and I guess you could say this gave me my research mojo. Skip forward another four years, and I'm at the end of my PhD, really, really, really close, about two weeks away, hopefully. And I've been able to research just that, the sources and fate of plastic going into our oceans and ending up on our beaches. When I started my PhD, I was thinking, well, plastic must come from landfills and from litter, but it can also come from a variety of different sources that we wouldn't necessarily always think of. One of those being microbees in facial scrubs. Microbees in facial scrubs are tiny bits of plastic that are used as exfoliants to get the dead skin off. But they're completely unnecessary because they can be used uh, instead with salt or sugar. 
We found that out that three million tiny plastic pieces could be in one bottle. In one squirt of your hand, there could be more than 10,000. We'll wash our faces, we'll wash our bodies, and these microplastic pieces will go down the sink, into the drains, and potentially through the sewage treatment works, and into our oceans, making our oceans into a big plastic soup. This was my first research piece, and it was really exciting to see the development and courage of people banning these products from their lives. And now governments around the world are banning the sale and production of microbeads. And that was all because of this little bit of research. The next bit of research that I did was looking at washing our clothes. And most of you sat here in the audience today, I'm sorry, but you're wearing plastic. This could be polyester, acrylic, or polyester cotton blend. In the mechanical nature of the washing machine, where our clothes are swishing and swirling around, tiny fibers can come off, and like the microbeads, go into our wastewater, potentially into our seas. We did some research that showed up to 700,000 fibers could come off our clothes in one wash. All of this research gained a lot of media attention, and it was really exciting to see how research can change industry, government, and public perception. And these were my, my first two research pieces, but my first two pieces into the large jigsaw that is solving marine litter. But we still have a really long way to go. I'm now excited to start the first bit of research after my PhD, which is looking again at washing our clothes. And this is in collaboration with Sky Ocean Rescue, of which I'm one of the scholars, and National Geographic. But we're going to be testing different inventions that are used in the washing machine to try and capture these fibers. So hold on, because in the future, I could be telling you the future of washing our clothes. Thank you. <laughs> Lily Sedigat is a Fulbright National Geographic digital storyteller. She's documenting Taiwan's waste management system and innovations in recycling. She's working to transform the way people see trash, transforming from just something we throw away to something that has value. She's also a one-woman demonstration of the power of an individual to have change. If you've seen her walking around campus this week, you might have noticed that she walks around with a little knapsack, which I've decided to think of as her plastic-free go bag. Everything in it is what you would need to have a full day plastic-free anywhere, anytime. The bowl, the utensils, the bottle, it really is that easy. Lily, tell us a little bit more about your work. I love Taiwanese milk tea. When I was 12 years old, I discovered the first tea house near my father's old apartment. I walked through the glass doors, straight up to the counter, ordered my first milk tea, and instantly fell in love. And for the next 10 years, I became a VIP at that tea house. And every time I ordered a da bei xiao bing ban tang de nai cha, which translates to a large cup, minimal sugar, minimal ice milk tea. And when I graduated from college, I went back to that same tea house, sat in that same orange chair facing the same window with my milk tea, to ask that post-graduation quintessential question, what the hell am I going to do with my life? <laughs> and as I reached for my milk tea and brought it close to me, I paused. You see, prior to that moment, all I did was drink that sweet, sugary goodness and threw it in the trash can. It was an accustomed habit. I didn't think much of it. But it was in that moment that I finally saw the plastic cup, and I finally saw the plastic straw. And I realized that every single time I drink the drink that I love, I'm destroying the environment that I love. So this led me on a global mission to Taiwan to understand our global plastic supply chain, the waste management system, and people's perceptions of plastic. And what I came to find is Taiwan is an incredible place. The island was formed by the collision of the Euro-Asian and Philippine plates. Two-thirds of it is covered in mountain. 90% of the 23.5 million people live on the rolling plains of the western coast. It has to import 98% of its energy, 70% of its food. And in fact, it became one of the rising Asian tigers as a result of one primary industry, 
plastics. Taiwan has one of the most sophisticated plastic supply chains in the world, both upscale and downscale. And at the time, before the 1980s, they had no waste management system whatsoever. So there were lots of claims of illegal dumping and lots of chances of people throwing their trash haphazardly on the floor. Well, a group of housewives were sick and tired of having their kids walk through trash to school every single day. So in the late 1980s, they formed an organization called the United Homemakers Foundation, and they charged the EPA with creating the modern system that Taiwan has today. Today, Taiwanese now have to divide their trash into three categories, burnables, recyclables, which have 33 different subcategories, and kitchen waste, which go towards their farms as fertilizer and for pig feed. Now, this incredible system is also coupled by an interesting tension. While plastics pervade their society, the idea of circular economy, of zero waste, of reusing your resources is on resurgence on the island. In fact, there are many small and medium-sized businesses that are charging ahead, one of which is this team of two powerful women who started an organization called For the Turtles, which sells glass straws on the market. And they're building an alliance with eco-friendly cafes across the island to revolutionize eco-friendly products inside the food industry. And then there are folks like T.A. Wu, who's the CEO of Springpool Glass. And he takes your discarded mobile phones and the LCD glass to transform them into fireproof, lightweight bricks for construction. So while the technological solutions are there, I realized that the problem is not technology. It is the perception of plastic. In Taiwan and in Japan, things that are wrapped in plastic are considered cleaner, fresher, of higher quality. And this is inextricably linked to the fear of plastic uh, in their supply chains. If they had better supply chains, then they could not rely on plastic. But they've had scares in the past of what's happened to their food and to their beverage. So plastic has become the solution. And in the United States, there are also other ways and reasons why we use plastic. Most of it is out of sight, out of mind. You kind of use your thing and you throw it away. You don't think about the environmental impact. Well, in order to transform the ways that we think about these things, we use storytelling. So what I did is I filmed and recorded sounds from Taipei City's waste management system, transformed them into a track, had Taipei's dancers dance to it, recorded the waste management system in that screen, and the idea was, you may not be able to see your trash, but you can't unhear it. So if we can transform the way that we perceive waste, we can transform the way we interact with it. But then we also realized that a lot of folks don't know really basic things about how to recycle, or what is plastic, or these processes. In fact, when you go to Starbucks, you may see that recycling sign on your Starbucks coffee cup. But the reality is, you can't recycle it. That's because inside is a small layer of PP plastic filling. And if you want to recycle it, you need to split the two materials. And if there's any sort of beverage or food residual in that recyclable, when you throw it into that bin, it's going straight to landfill. So I understand that we also live in a time where it's a to-go culture. We don't have much time to do anything. You grab and you go. But our choices are what's driving this system. So what I did, I did a 12-day zero plastic waste challenge. And while I couldn't get to zero, the reality is there are choices that we can make in our day-to-day -day lives to make this change. As was stated earlier, you can bring your own cup. You can bring your own utensils. You can bring your own straw. You can even bring an alpaca with you and have a wonderful journey in your eco-waste hunt. <laughs> That's what I do. Her name is Anastasia. <laughs> Ultimately, it is our choices that ignite change. But our choices are based upon our perceptions. So if we can transform our perceptions of waste, then we have a solution for the future. Thank you. Heather Caldway is a kite surfer with a soft spot for seahorses. But she's also a National Geographic Fellow, and she's head of marine and freshwater conservation at the Zoological Society of London. Small jobs, this one. <laughs> As you saw from the intro video to this session, 
For the last few years, Heather's been working in small island communities, the people that are at the front lines of plastic pollution, working together with these communities to develop innovative approaches to tackling the problem. And back in London, she and her team have also been coming up with creative ways to engage the public to transform the way London approaches drinking water. Heather. So I'm a marine biologist passionate about seahorses, and this image summarizes my journey from seahorses to plastic. Today, if you're a marine biologist, you come across plastic whether you want to or not. My journey with seahorses about 20 years ago took me to the Philippines, one of the richest areas of marine biodiversity on the planet. But it is where ocean population, poverty, and plastic collide in communities just like this. The pressure on marine resources has resulted in overfishing, which threatens lo local livelihoods of very poor people. And that leads to more and more fishing nets catching fewer and fewer fish, and those nets are made of plastic. Globally, we estimate that 640,000 tons of discarded fishing nets enter the ocean every year, where they degrade and are left also catching and entangling wildlife. These nets last anywhere between 650 years and forever. It's not just nets. These communities have no kind of waste management system, so we're dealing with all kinds of plastic accumulating and entering the ocean. We took one kind of plastic, these discarded fishing nets, and developed an inclusive business approach to dealing with it. We looked at collecting those discarded nets out of the ocean, of cleaning those nets and gathering them off the beaches where they were laying, bailing the nets using innovative engineering based on a wine press, aggregating the nets from different communities, transporting them in efficient bales to be exported. Because these nets are a very high-grade nylon that has significant value in the recycling market. And Aquafil in Slovenia recycle this to nylon yarn, which is then made into beautiful carpet tiles by Interface. So here we have a system of solving a problem. It's powered by community banks, a, a self-help uh, means of finance that brings much needed uh, financial mechanisms to these communities, but also a mechanism of buying the selling the nets and organizing that to happen. The end result of this work is cleaner beaches. The nets are now removed. We know reduced dependence on fishing and increased well-being. So we have an economic model that works environmentally and socially. To date, we've collected 167,000 tons of nets. Uh, sorry, 160 tons of nets which is enough to go round the world four times as a functional fishing net. 64,000 people have benefited from this approach by having cleaner environments and greater income. And we've linked this to bigger and better marine protected areas. So we actually have a lot more fish and a lot less plastic. But we only have one ocean. And as you've heard, plastic is everywhere. We've tried to think about this approach by taking the single-use plastic water bottle as a flagship species for the ocean plastic issue. And one city where I'm based, of London. Londoners use 1.2 billion single-use plastic water bottles a year. That's 175 per person. It's slightly higher in the States. And it's not just remote islands in developing countries where we see piles of plastic. This is the River Thames in London. We're looking at changing an entire system from one dominated by a disposable, single-use plastic culture, a throwaway society, to one that's dominated by refill. And we've developed a really innovative collaboration with lots of different skill sets to achieve that. We've had to look at everything from behavior 
business case, infrastructure, design policy, and social norms. This is an issue for everybody, not just greeny tree huggers like me. <laughs> We're making amazing progress, partly helped by the great interest and attention on this issue. We've piloted drinking fountains, new solutions like a refill scheme, because it turns out that Brits will carry a refillable bottle but are too embarrassed to ask to have it refilled. So by putting a sticker and stores with a, a refill scheme by a group called City to Sea, it breaks down that barrier to make it okay to go and ask. We're doing the science to make the change and getting great traction with policy. Commitments from the mayor in his environment strategy and with Surfers Against Sewage, we now have commitment for a plastic-free parliament. What we do with the plastic, what we do with a bottle, it's our choice. And here we have the luxury of choice. We choose planet or plastic. And my choice is planet. And I hope yours is too. Thank you. This is great, and since we have a team who stuck to timing, we're going to get a good, robust discussion going. So I'm just going to start the conversation, but I know that this is a hot topic, so I want to turn it over to all of you very quickly. But I first want to step back from the issue for a minute and take advantage of the four of you being here, women in different stages of your careers, doing different kinds of work, certainly having faced different obstacles along the way. So I want to take a little bit of advantage and dig into your backgrounds a little bit. Um, so thinking about your journey to today, particularly in the context of being women in male-dominated fields or working in cultures or communities where there are unique challenges for women, um, I'm going to start with Jenna and Heather. So think for a second, if you could co go back to the beginning of your career, if you could go back and talk to yourself at that point, what advice would you give to yourself? Maybe I'll start with you, Heather. <laughs> um, well, I feel pretty lucky sitting here as a National Geographic fellow um, with an amazing group of people around me, so I wouldn't say do too much differently. Um, <laughs> it was okay. I think possibly uh, less angst about the need for a career plan and making a lot of random choices along the journey. Um, and I, my, my PhD is in the population genetics of Welsh trout, and I'm here as a National Geographic <laughs> expert fellow on plastic. So either they got it wrong or um, I changed it along the way. Um, so I think it, it, it has been that uh, being open to different uh, opportunities. I think looking for support networks, I think looking back at time, it's been quite a lonely place and actually finding uh, your people um, in all walks of life, whether that's at work or um, outside work. It's finding a place where you can vent or find support um, when things are tough. And possibly I was a bit too independently charging ahead on my own. And there are amazing support networks wherever you look. And sometimes it's just being humble enough to ask for help. Great. Jenna? Um, so I didn't, I'm going to go with the women uh, perspective a bit, um, and I didn't see myself as different than men um, and didn't think that, you know, I could do anything they could do. And, but I think maybe uh, that was a bit naive, and um, I, I would maybe tell myself that bias is real, implicit bias is, happens, and um, to value myself and even be a better advocate for myself because once you sort of let that bar slide, it's much harder to come back to sort of prove equality later, I guess. And if you're not aware of that, then you may not um, work towards that from the first place. But um, I'm going to say one more thing. I felt like I haven't fit into very many boxes, but I feel like I fit in here with explorers maybe a lot because nobody's in a box here. <laughs> and so I'm really happy to be here and I feel very welcomed, so. I think hearing, hearing from you um, in conversations that we've had over the last couple of weeks, I, I particularly wanted to have this conversation, hearing that as um, a world-renowned scientist, you're working in a department where you might get an email 
that says, gentlemen, here's what's happening in our department. That seems wholly unacceptable um, that that could still be happening today. So I think yep. this, it's still a relevant conversation that we need to keep having. Um, Imogen, you're in a really different place in your career, just kicking off, but you've been working in a research lab with um, very famous people. And I just want to get a little bit of your perspective on what are you, where do you see great opportunity and where might there still be some challenges that you're sensing? I think I've been really lucky that I've never faced any obstacles. And if I did, then I'd purposely do something to prove a point that I could do it. Mm -hmm. In my office, there's some, we have a really good support network, like we were saying before. And most of the PhD people are women. Mm -hmm but we're surrounded by professors and all bar one are men. So looking to the future and seeing the leadership within my own department is quite difficult. And also looking to the future, I know some of my colleagues are worried that when they start having a family, is it gonna be hard to get back into research? So I think there's a lot of unknowns in my career, but I'm excited for the future. That's great. You know, I did a little bit of digging in the last couple days and was really surprised to learn that Taiwan ranks incredibly high on measures of gender equality. That's right. um, and then I also found a lot of people talking about, you know, we have, they have a female prime minister, president, um, female leadership in the country, yet there is serious gender bias that still exists in, in Taiwan culturally. It's embedded in the culture. And you've just spent nine months there, um, women running around alone, digging into waste systems and interesting things. So what, what's your experience been like? You know, I find um, that sometimes being a woman is actually a really wonderful thing. And uh, <laughs> you can be traveling around with your backpack. And I was serious about my alpaca. She sticks out of the back of my backpack. And uh, you'll just walk on the street. And you'll look somebody in the eye, and you'll smile at them and they'll smile back at you, especially the older women. They love smiling back at you. Mm. And you realize like that, that human connection is so beautiful and it's so real. And that's what we're missing a lot today in our society. And I think I have an advantage as a woman because you, know, you smile at a granny, she smiles back, you have that, that connection. You know? um, I found that traveling alone was not an issue. Um, it was more so that in Taiwan, um, there are Taiwanese and then there's Waigoren, people from the outside, outside people. And I don't look like Taiwanese at all. I make a joke that my parents come from Iran and they have a little place called Ilan. So in Chinese, I Iran is Ilan, Iran. And so like, oh, you should Taiwanren ma? Like, are you Taiwanese? And it's like, no, I don't come from Ilan. I come from Iran. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's kind of funny. But I find that, you know, human, being a human being, regardless of your gender, you can make it work. And, uh, being a Waigoren and being connecting with local people is really important because it shares your, your shared humanity. That's great. Okay, I'll bring us back now, back to plastics. Um, I wanna talk about the magazine because it was incredible, it is incredible, and hopefully everybody has seen the biggest poster in all of Washington, D.C. across the street. Um, if I could get the picture of the cover of the magazine, please. So Jenna, you had a lot to do with this content. Laura Parker was the author behind the feature story, and I know she spent quite a bit of time with you in Georgia. And you know, this particular choice that was settled on for the cover has been um, interesting in how much conversation it's been sparking, more than I actually expected it to. And as somebody who's been working really in this space with waste for a long time, I'd just love to get your perspective on the notion of the iceberg mm -hmm. and what, that, what you think that that actually means. Yeah, so um, I feel like it has two meanings. Um, and the first is a bit more literal in that, you know, we calculated the quantity of plastic entering the ocean every year. And what we have quantified in terms of the floating plastic is a standing stock and that is only a fraction of what we see going in every year. And so in that way, it begs the question, where is the missing plastic? And that is just the tip of the iceberg, what we see floating out there. And then a bit more uh, figuratively, thinking about this issue as a whole, it's fairly um, new in terms of the science, although it has ramped up really quickly. Um, you know, I feel like we just have the tip of the iceberg of what we know about it, of what we, 
um, understand the impacts to be, and so there's much more out there to be discovered and to learn and really understand about what the implications are of plastic everywhere. That's great. Um, and I, I do want to ask Heather you one question before I turn it over, as I promised I would. Um, the work that you've been doing with networks, I've been really impressed, and the piece of it that I find almost most interesting of all of it is how much you're drawing from other different sectors and different disciplines and learning things from other areas that have done things well, like the finance mechanisms and pulling from the development community or going to use something like a wine press to bail your nets. Um, where do you see great potential moving forward? We do have a theme this year of collaborating to ignite change. So where are some of those collaborations that you might look to moving forward? It's definitely a case of sort of breaking down the barriers. And I think the fascinating thing about the plastic topic, it is completely all sectors we need involved. So obviously there's very diverse expertise across this panel, but also it requires design, market product design, marketing, um, engineers, uh, all sorts of different sectors to come together to actually solve it. Um, I think that's the, the, the challenge and the opportunity. In terms of uh, looking at networks, I think it's quite hard, particularly in science, because you specialize so quickly that it's even hard to keep up with other scientific di disciplines that are related. And so then thinking about how can I talk to business or how do I talk to a marketing agency to get my science message across becomes more challenging. Um, but these are the areas we have to break down. We were very fortunate to be invited to a, a workshop by Interface who are looking at this topic around their very ambitious sustainability strategy because of our scientific expertise and, and one of my uh, colleagues in particular. And that started this process going. And for me in conservation, what was particularly interesting is we tend to think in business about how do we get business doing less harm. Actually, the ambition set by Interface was, was way ahead of our thinking. And actually, uh, the, it, the businesses bring expertise. Our, our collaboration with Selfridges has really transformed our ability to communicate um, marine conservation to completely new audiences and to stop talking to ourselves, which we tend to do a lot of. So I think it is um, thinking out of the box and then also being bold enough to try and make contact with those sectors that we actually don't have those easy links with now. And often that comes from social circles and others um, or attending unusual meetings or events that you wouldn't normally as a marine biologist and not being afraid to have conversations um, looking for solutions. That's great. Your turn. Oh, I see lots of hands. This is great. <laughs> okay, let's start right here up front, please. And just wait for the mic. This is absolutely wonderful. And I've got a, a general question based on my personal life experiences with the Zebeline garbage pickers of Cairo, who I lived among and then brought home to my own home. And Lily, you, you talked about changing the perception of garbage. And we have a special relationship because we're in the mentor-mentee program. So it's great to see you up on stage. Um, the, the Zabaline ethic is that plastic is so valuable that you would never let it go in the ocean because there's so many things you can do with it. And when I took that message from living with them home, this idea that microplastics are sites for bacterial biofilm growth that can cause methylmercury, for example, or that washing our clothes can put microfibers into the ocean. In our home, based on the Zabaline ethic, we're scavenging constantly in the biodigester and aquaponics fields for urban plastic garbage to put into our biodigesters for biofilm growth to enhance their production rates, to put into our aquaponics to do denitrification to enhance the fish growth. And so when we wash our clothes now, all of the fibers go into our household biodigester and then into the aquaponic system. And so our plastic never leaves our home in our off-grid experience in Florida. So my question, the general was, if the Zebeline in Cairo and the other trash picking peoples that we visited in the world know this value, why can't we get a policy going saying, you can't let it leave your home or your community. You're stuck with it. There's no way because enough of us has done it in the world to show that there is no way and that we like that. We want our plastic to stay at home. So can we get that consciousness or why can't we? Small question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take a first stab. Um, so policy, I'm not a policy maker by any means. Um, I'm a storyteller. But what I understand is the way we understand things affects the choices that we make and those choices often become policy. 
And I think the elephant in the room that we have to address formally is the economics, the tie to economics. You know, um, for a lot of people in the world, they use plastic in these small satchels because they can't afford to get bulk. There's no Costco in rural India, right? You can only afford a little bit, and that's tied to your economics. You know, in America, like, we have uh, a system where we have ultimate choice. We have lots of choices. We have an abundance of choices, and those choices come from the fact that a lot of our supplies are shipped from many different places around the world. And the reason plastic became such a big thing is because it's cheaper to make, and it's easier to transport. And a lot of people thought that this, this plastic being was so wonderful because not only were we not taking away from natural resources because man had created his own resource, um, but it was also the notion that, that these objects um, could transform our lives. So um, I think what it really requires is a government to get behind and realize, which we're seeing in, in the UK especially and in places like Taiwan, um, that they are resources. Um, our government has yet to address that issue, and that's one of my goals is when I go back home is to bring it to the forefront of my local municipality in San Diego to do something about it. Um, but it starts with people caring, and when you care, then you make a difference. Another question, Sylvia. So I think we're letting the fishing industry and those who consume ocean wildlife off the hook a bit with our focus primarily on domestic plastic bags, straws, cosmetics, when we know that much of what is clogging the ocean comes from the new lightweight, relatively inexpensive gear that has been introduced into the sea since the 1950s. Before that time, every net, every line was treasured handmade out of products that you, you you fix the net if it got torn today. If a net gets torn, it's easy. It's economically attractive just to throw it away. But the idea that there's a business model built on, on these lightweight materials, primarily from inshore fishers, but the big problems are the industrial scale fishers that supply 90% of the quotes, seafood, sea life to this country and around the world. It's this large scale extraction of wildlife from the sea made possible because of these wonderful new materials that did not exist a few decades ago. That coupled with our appetite and our ignorance about the real consequences of what, what a tuna fish sandwich really costs when you think about where it comes from, how it was caught. Where is that gear? I'd love to hear your insights into this, this um, major issue that is getting fairly light attention because I guess it's because of our appetite for the wildlife that we like to consume. And, and yet when you think about what it takes to get them to your plate, you might choose, you might think again. So I'd love to um, very quickly, Heather, if you have a, a quick response on nets and maybe Jenna, if you want to talk about just um, the, what the value proposition means when it changes from heavier duty plastics to lighter weight plastics. So we could have a whole panel obviously on sustainable fisheries and reducing our impact on the ocean. So I'm not going to touch on that. I think the bit that's missing that I had insight from working with recycling business is why isn't that part of the conversation? So why isn't there a circular economy around nets? Why isn't that factored into when nets are designed? And why isn't that part of certification of sustainable fisheries is what happens to the net at end of life? At the moment, there's a big disincentive to bring your net back to port where you may have to pay for it to go to landfill. Um, commercial nets also go to aquafil, so that is, there are solutions for some types of nets and there's some great initiatives happening, but we need to factor that into the whole conversation about sustainable fisheries and nets need to be designed for disaggregation and as a part of the circular economy and the materials they're made of and how they're made. Okay, um, so quickly, you know, I think what we've seen with plastic is that because it is so lightweight and inexpensive and people have used it for this large transport of goods and even you know the nets weigh less than and they think we're conserving resources ironically that is what led to 
at what leads to these materials being low value at their end of life. And so they're not recovered because there's not as much plastic there. So it's sort of this uh, dichotomy and tension there because it maybe saves on one end, but it actually, in terms of a life cycle, how do you quantify the impact of, of killing these sea creatures within that system? And so um, low value means it's very likely to be leaked, and that's what we see into the ocean. So I'm gonna take the liberty of the last question to Imogen. How soon until we have some kind of tool to actually capture microfibers from our washing machine? Hopefully wait till the end of my research. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna be testing different inventions and you know, bright ideas. Some are gonna be more successful than others, but it's all part of innovation. I think looking into the future, this is where we need to be. We need to be looking at these bright ideas and changing the way that and our behaviors, especially in the washing system. So hopefully wait maybe a year and two years and I'll come back with a proper answer. <laughs> That's great. So if you wanna hear more about solutions, we are also gonna have quite a bit of that on Saturday. So definitely come back for the public sessions where you'll hear a little bit more from Heather and we'll also have some other National Geographic explorers on stage talking about solutions in plastics. And don't leave your seat because I know there's something exciting coming up next. Thank you very much. Please give the panel a great warm round of applause. Thank you all so very much. And now it's time for a very special performance to end the day. This is gonna be so exciting. Okay. The Hakana Art and Music Project teaches tropical e ecosystems of Colombia to all of us through songs and through illustrated booklets for children. So here to play for us, oh, it's gonna be incredible is Gianni Benavides. Let's welcome her. <laughs> 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 